Welcome everybody to tonight's home clinic. A home clinic is where we grab one quality coach and he presents on one specific subject for you guys to enjoy and he usually does that from home. If you guys have been enjoying this series and would like to see it continue, uh, we wanna ask that you would like and subscribe below. Those things certainly help us to grow and is kind of that feedback to say this is, yeah, this is a good thing, keep this coming. If you have a desire to present in the future, reach out to us on Twitter, DM us, that's at Chief at the Chief Pigskin. All right, without further ado, tonight's home clinic. Hey, I'm Daniel McDonald, head football coach at Our Lady of Providence High School in Clarksville, Indiana. I'm here with Coach Derek Smith, strength and conditioning coordinator and O-line coach at Southside High School in Arkansas. Coach Smith, great to have you on. We're going to talk a little bit today about uh, practice plan and workout plans for COVID restrictions, maybe a little bit about social media, and uh, maybe a little strength and conditioning work as well. Glad to be on, man. Appreciate the opportunity, and, and glad to see everybody slowly getting back to what we do. Some sense of normalcy, right? Yeah, yeah. A different normal, but... Hopefully not the new normal, man. Hopefully we can, we can get past this at some point. Yeah. Um, Coach, I started following you on social media. Probably you might have been one of my first few follows for some reason. I don't know how I came across you or whatever way back when on, on Twitter, but um, you're over 12,000 followers. Um, how, what, what, how did you build your social media presence? What were some of the – did you plan on having such a strong social media presence? And then how did honestly, you build it? Honestly, didn't plan on it at all. Just kind of something came about, but then – uh, you know, just sharing what your issues you deal with as a coach, sharing things you've learned from as a coach, uh, trying not to always be a hairy hard day and uh, showing the mistakes and uh, funny things that happen to you along the way, uh, you know, just kind of help. And then uh, it, it's kind of like uh, the same way if, if you uh, – if you're trying to find a girlfriend or a wife, you know there's lots of uh, good-looking guys out there. Uh, you got to do something to kind of set yourself apart, and uh, I think if you can make somebody laugh, that that helps quite a bit. Uh, you know, gain an interest in uh, what you're doing. So just kind of do that, and then share a lot about what I've learned in strength and conditioning, and and go from there. Yeah, that was one of the things for me that that made you a good follow was um, the, the technique videos, really the power cleans, the squats. You know, I, I use some of your videos as teach tape back when I was teaching, back when I had my hand kind of dipped in strength and conditioning. So that was really helpful. And, you know, you talk about some of the funny stuff that happens. That's, you know, there's never a dull moment on your Twitter account, really. Let's be honest about it. <laughs> uh, it's good to, I like to have a good time, man. Our kids like to have a good time. So glad to share it. Heard that. Well, Coach, the next thing we're going to talk about is kind of a preface to your presentation is how you're dealing with, COVID restrictions, but trying to maintain some kind of structure and normalcy at practice? It's, uh, you know, it's been different, and I got quite a bit of it in my presentation, but just going right here, you know, uh, I guess the biggest thing I would say is have the conversation with your kids the day you start that let me know if you're feeling bad in terms of you're dizzy, you're sick, and it's not going to be something where I'm judging you and going to hold it against you in August or September or October, or in my case, tell your volleyball coach or your basketball coach. It's not going to be something where I think, oh, well, so-and-so got dizzy and couldn't make it through the workout today. They didn't do what they're supposed to do. Yeah, you know, we gave them workouts and they probably didn't do what they're supposed to do, but they also may have been watching a little brother full time or watching a little sister full time. They also may have been working, you know, to help their parents, uh, who may have got laid off during this time. So uh, it's important to understand that, yeah, you know, we gave the kids workouts, but honestly, uh, strength and conditioning, in my regard, probably wasn't their biggest priority while they were off. And then some of them probably just didn't have anything going on and just decided to be kids for, for 10 weeks. So, uh, you know, whether it's the right decision, wrong decision, just have that conversation and let them know you're not going to hold it against them because the last thing we need is a kid to pass out on us or a kid to, to die on us and uh you know if you can have any impact in that not happening i think it's important to do i agree 100 percent. and then you know the other thing you gotta think about too is there's probably coaches who are going to come to their first day of workouts uh 
conditioning tests, going all gung ho. Like like you said, the kids were probably being kids for ten weeks, or they were taking care. Of, like you said, this circumstance, that circumstance, whatever. So, you know, not to sound too cliche, but I think there is some element of empathy and understanding, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, as far as the conditioning test goes, I mean, I can save you the time. I'll tell you, they're not if they need to be in. Uh, right. You'll know that as a coach five minutes into your warm up when you do 10 yards of high knees, 10 yards of butt kicks, a little overhead lunge, and, and then you got a kid puking. Uh, there's no need to go run them to know uh, they're not where they need to be. And the thing is, in most states, you know, I, I, I'm speaking from our state, but a lot of other states are in the same boat. We're all starting at the same place. So it's not like we've been working and the school we're playing hasn't been working or the school we're going to play has been working and we haven't been working. We're all in the same boat and we've all had the same amount of time off. So it's not like anybody's uh, gotten a head start on anybody. It's not like we got to make up for lost time. That's why it's called lost time. You can't get it back. So. Exactly. Well, coach, whenever you're ready, man, go ahead and share your screen. I'm looking forward to this presentation. All right. All right, guys, just a couple of considerations, you know, that I've thought about and learned as we brought kids back and, and, all that, you know, it's uh, – Kurt Hester talked about this, Louisiana Tech strength coach, and uh, it's something we've never been through before. So there's no – there's nothing to compare it to in terms of going from having your kids highly trained to having 10 weeks off. Regardless of if you agree with it or not, it doesn't change the fact that your kids have had 10 weeks off uh, to essentially be to their own devices. So – there's no test for it. There's nothing to compare this to in terms of stuff in our careers. So it's a, uh, it's a new territory that we all got to work through together. And then I was, you know, uh, I'm a big science based guy in terms of what we do in the weight room. And I saw a quote the other day, I forget, maybe it was Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, and he said, science is correct, rather you believe it or not. And the thing is with this, we don't know the science behind it yet. So there's really nobody who can be correct in terms of, we should treat our kids exactly as they were as we left, or we need to be extra precautious because one thing, we don't know what this disease does or this virus does in terms of your lung function after you get it and come back or if you've been exposed to it. We, so we, there's a lot of unknowns is what I'm saying, and, and that's important we think about that when we, when we go forward with our kids. And then the biggest thing I've learned in the first three weeks since we've been back is what is most feasible and safe versus what is optimal. And so what I mean by that is in Arkansas, you essentially, you can have as many as you want in your weight room as long as you're 12 feet apart. Now, whether everybody follows that or not is a different thing, but that's what the rule says and that, that's what we're gonna do. And so square footage wise of our weight room, we could fit 28 in it and knock that out in two groups essentially, but that would be if we fit 28 kids in there and they didn't move from one station to another. They just sat in one spot. So that would require every kid having their, have their own piece of equipment. And, and we just don't have the, the equipment to do that. And so rather than, and I got to work with all sports. So if I can only bring kids in in groups of 10 to actually get to use everything, uh, we got 150 athletes sometimes come through a day. You know, it'd be a 15 hour work day. And, uh, you know, that's just kind of hard to do over the course of a summer. And then you got other sports you got to blend in there too. So uh, I've learned that to go with number one during these times, obviously, what is most safe for the kids and containing the spread of the virus and then what is most feasible. So, yeah, I, I'm a big weight room guy. I freaking love the weight room. To me, it's one of the most important things you can do, you know, for the development of your kids. but Right now, it, with the restrictions, we just can't get everybody in the weight room like we were before. And so the first two weeks, I actually got a couple, you know, practice plans on here we'll go over. The first two weeks, we were all on the field. So everything we did was on the field. And then now, the end of last week and this week, we're phasing in. We got two field groups, and then we have one group in the weight room, essentially 10 kids per group. And so we've started phasing them back into the weight room that way. Uh, and now, is it exactly what I want? No. 
but is it feasible and is it safe? Yes. So that's what we're going to do right now until these are lifted. Um, and number four, like we talked about, we've already hit this a bunch. I don't want to harp on it. It's not the kid's fault that they had 10 weeks off, you know, to be a kid. Uh, I think a lot of times as coaches, we get a false sense of how we were as a player uh, and how bought in and dedicated we were. A lot of times we were, there's, there's no doubt about it. But uh, a lot of times, if you really think back on it, you know, you, you probably weren't and you probably did some things to piss your coach off, just like your coach does, or your kids do to piss you off as a coach. Uh, you know, I think back to college and I'm day before my 21st birthday, uh, I told our coaches, I'm not going to be at practice tomorrow. I'm turning 21 tomorrow. I'm turning 21 tonight, and uh, I won't be at practice tomorrow. I'm, I'm going and having a good time. And and I think now as a coach, if I was in that situation, it pissed me off. But, uh, you know, you got to think back to some of the things you did as a kid. You were probably a little hard-headed too. And so understand that when your kids do it. Obviously, have your culture, have your standards, and, and don't waver on those. But also don't get a false sense of uh, things you did as a player and and, and, and the kids will respect you for that. So, uh, number five, always error on the side of caution. You know, we talked about this. I'm always going to shut a kid down early instead of risking a kid passing out. Uh, and that's – I don't want to sit here and act like I'm talking from a pedestal. That's coming from mistakes I've made along the way and lessons I've learned, not just I'm here treating kids like a piece of glass and, and, and we can't push them. It's that I've made – some of these mistakes in my career and I don't want to make them again. And if a young guy's listening, I don't want him to have to make them uh, and learn from them. So, and then, like we said, number six, be open with the kids. Uh, tell them, you know, I ask our kids all the time, how are we feeling? You know, and it's kids natural instinct to be tough guy uh, and tell you, and I ask our girls all the time, how are we feeling? We good today. And 99% of the time, Oh, we're good. We're good. But then I'll, know, I'll ask, no, how are you really feeling today? Because I want to know how they're feeling. Are they sore? Do I need to back off on something? Uh, you know, is something going on outside of here uh, that I need to know about that I can help you with or whatever? So be open with your kids and ask them a second time when you ask them how they're feeling and let them know you want to actually physically know how they're feeling, not just a generic, oh, I'm good, coach. Let's, you know, let's keep rolling. And then uh, we talked about this, Coach, when we got going. Uh, like I said, I can tell you guys right now, your kids aren't where you need them to be. Uh, some of them may be, and that's awesome. Every kid's going to have kids that are gung-ho, 100% bought in, uh, didn't have other issues pop up over the break, didn't have parents lose a job, whatever it may be. Uh, but for every one of those kids, there's going to be five kids that didn't. And so it's important to know that in uh, – Again, don't waste the time in doing a conditioning test or running your kids into the ground. That's a day you could have got better doing skill work. That's a day you could have got better, you know, getting reacclimated to to the demands of the game. And then, so this is I, I still a lot of stuff from this guy. You know, first thing, I've hardly invented. I don't think I've invented one single thing. I just steal stuff from people a hell of a lot smarter than me. Just as all coaches do, rather it be with scheme. Uh, or whatever, and then you know you put your take on it. But this is from a, a rugby strength coach. He's got he's got a pretty good Twitter. If you don't follow him, I recommend following him. But uh, he was talking about the increased risk of injury after the NFL lockout. Now, obviously, our kids haven't been in an NFL lockout, but they have been in a similar amount of time in terms of the NFL players went from being highly trained to a long time off, and then they came back – essentially abruptly. And that's exactly what we've been through. And they noticed when that happened that they had a 240% increase in Achilles tendon ruptures. And so that's a huge, you know, risk factor that we can help negate, not just Achilles tendon fractures, but, you know, hamstring strains. If you got, if you got a kid, it's a real fast twitch kid and he tweaks a hamstring, you know, that's, that's gonna, that may hamper him two, three months as to where if you got a kid and he's not a super fast twitch kid, he could be back in, you know, two, three weeks. But uh, that's something you definitely need to consider. And, again, always err on the side of caution when it comes to that. And then I stole this from Scott uh, at William & Mary, and he uh, – I tried to get the tweet with it, but I couldn't. So this is from his Twitter. Uh, 
And it says, as, as the light at the end of the tunnel begins to show for sports to return, coaches should remember that it only took 25 days off from a Division I strength and conditioning program in 10 110s, something we've all either given as coaches or done as players, whatever, 10 110s, we've all done it. Uh, but it took just that amount to kill a kid uh, at a Division I program. And that is, to me, something that I, it's always in the back of my mind during a workout. I don't want to over push a kid to, to the point of where he could possibly die. And I think until you've, again, this comes from experience, until you've flirted with that line, you don't realize how important it is and how easily, you know, it can happen. Uh, I think back to my first strength and conditioning job, it wasn't running, but it was a rep scheme in the weight room. Uh, and first off, I never give a kid anything that either A, I hadn't done, and then B, that I haven't studied and it's actually applicable to them. Uh, Cause I've done a lot of dumb rep schemes myself that I'd never do with the kids. Uh, but we, we put them on a similar uh, rep scheme and then that I'd studied and um, you know, 99% of the kids responded well and 99% of the kids it, it was awesome for but this one particular kid uh, and the circumstances he was going through and his body type and a host of other issues outside of football with regards to him being able to properly care for himself. Uh, combined with that, he had to go get, he had to go to the hospital, the ambulance had to get him. Uh, this was two days later. And like I said, it wasn't just that, it was other issues combined with that. Uh, but he had to go get tested for rhabdo. And which you know, if you're a college strength and conditioning guy, and, and if you get a couple kids with rhabdo, you're basically fired. Uh, luckily, he did not have it, but just the issue of him having to actually get tested for it really, really opened my mind to how fine of a line it is we uh, we we work with when when we overtrain kids. So uh, I'm definitely not a guy that, uh, like I said, I'm not going to treat them like they're a piece of glass, but I'm also going to realize they're a human being, and uh, there's things we can do, you know, to be safe. Uh, there, there's this debate, you know, everybody says minimum effective dose, minimum effective dose, and I'm not a big minimum effective dose guy. I do like to overreach a little bit, uh, but I like to responsibly overreach. And I, I, like, I look at more maximal, maximable recoverable dose. So what can I do that they can completely recover from and be good to go the next day or the day after that versus what I know I can do today and then, yeah, they're 100% sure better tomorrow. But did we really get enough done? So I just to toe that line. And uh, like I said, it takes some coaching to learn and uh, some mistakes along the way uh, to, to help you find that line. And so how to structure uh, your workouts post COVID? First of all, so our district uh, kind of put me in charge of structuring our workouts and how we were going to actually get the kids into the workout what we're going to actually do. So if you're, you know, an AD listening or a principal listening or, or a head coach listening who has a strength coach, I would get with your administration or your strength coach, get with your administration and let them know you're willing to lead the way in terms of getting the kids back. And also if you're a strength coach, let your administration know that this is a time unlike any other and that where your role is hugely important in terms of getting the kids back to where they were. And, and, you know, not every school has a strength coach, uh, obviously. Uh, but if you're fortunate enough to have one, definitely do that. And then if you're the strength coach and you coach your sport or whatever, just assume that role of right now, safety is your biggest priority versus getting your kids stronger or getting your kids faster. You can do all that, but safety takes a bigger precedent now than it almost ever has. Uh, so what we've done – is a uh, coach is a lot smarter than me on our staff. Uh, coach Garrett Denton and Jonathan Edwards, they came up with this Google doc. And then, um, so I had put it, we use team builder and I had put the questions into team builder for the kids to do. But what we realized day one is, yeah, 70% of kids could do it and do it on their phone. But then we got 30% that don't have a phone or their phone's dead or their phone's in their car. And so now we're holding up the whole line to get everybody in. So what we did was they created a Google Doc. I'll 
click on it here, it should pop up. All right, so our, like I said, our coaches made this. And then what this is, is just a Google form. And then it's shared with every sport coach uh, at our school. And then they'll do the actual check-in of the athletes. We'll go over how we do that. Uh, but then I'm on the field with them, actually getting them lined up and doing all that. So here it just, they put their, the kid puts their name in. Uh, our state doesn't require us to actually get their temperature, uh, but as a district, we're taking precautions uh, for ourselves so we get their temperature. That goes in there. Sport participating in. Have you know your basic COVID questions you got to have. Uh, these are the ones our state has asked us to have. And then so then they submit it. And then now if something were to happen or something goes wrong as a coach and your administration wants to know, did you ask the questions? Did you do all that? Then you got documentation right there, you know, that proves uh, you did what you're supposed to do and you did your job. So I'd highly recommend doing that. And like I said, the coaches, obviously a Google Forms not hard. Uh, I'm not near as technologically disadvanced as uh, they think I am, but sometimes I'll let them think that uh, and then they end up doing stuff like this that I wasn't going to have to do, but they think I didn't know how, so they did it. Uh, so appreciate it, guys. And then, uh, so that's that. And then now I'll go over like how our kids actually arrive uh, and do all that. So let me go back. All right, are we back on the PowerPoint? Yes, sir. All right. Get back to where we were. All right, and then so like I said, our football team basically has, you know, around 50 kids. Uh, so we split them up into two groups of 24 to 26, uh, and we bring those kids in. Uh, seven to eight, one group comes. Eight to nine, one group comes. And then our other sports uh, come after that. And then some ways we've social distance. Let me go ahead and go to the field so we can see it here and how we actually get them here. All right, so there's a gate here by our field house. This is actually a very old picture, but this is where the kids enter from. And so their sport coach is here with the form. And then I'm kind of down here walking them to the field, getting them set up. What they do when they get here is if you go to basically any chain link fence, it'll have poles in it and those poles are further than six feet apart. And so what we do, is the kid knows when they get there, they line up on the pole, then the next kid's on this pole, then the next kid's on this pole, then the next kid's on this pole, and they pole it all the way out. And so they enter here. Locker rooms in Arkansas right now are off limits, so they do not even enter the field house at all. So they have to come dressed. Uh, they have to bring their own water. Uh, obviously, we're not Harry Hardays. We have some water uh, bottles, and we're not going to deny a kid of water uh, if they forget there's, you know, uh, I'm going to take care of them. But they'll line up all the way here. And then when they leave, they'll leave out this exit because another group of kids is coming in at this exit. And I know, like, as coaches, we may not agree with this whole thing. We may not agree with getting shut down. But bottom line is it's here. And somebody at some point, sometime, is going to get sued over this ordeal. And so you better be, you know, covering your butt in terms of the logistics, regardless of if you believe it or not. So kids leave out this gate. So I, I'd recommend having a separate entrance and separate exit. All right. And then in terms of spacing, how we've done it, line up one kid on the hash or one kid on the sideline. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. Like, Okay. And then we got one kid on the hash, another kid on the hash, and then another kid on the sideline. And we just stack that all the way down the field according to how big the group is. You know, so for football, we essentially stop at the 25 or 30. If it's a Tuesday or Thursday night and I got cheer and dance, uh, those groups can reach up to like 60 or 70. So we stack way down the field. Uh, and so that way kids are at all times, the closest they are, is 15 feet during the workout. And, you know, our state recommends 12 during the workout. Uh, so we got three extra feet built in there for, you know, whatever, just to be safe. And so, like I said, the closest they ever get together is 15 feet. And then we do all our different drills. You know, you can work forward in groups of, in yard, yard increments of 10, 15, 20, whatever it is. But the kids are still keeping that distance apart. They're just working down the field 
the whole grid of the field moves uh, as the kids move. Let me make sure I didn't forget anything uh, back here on the PowerPoint. All right, yeah, we'll go back over that. Share maps. Share. All right, and then so we'll do all our warm up, uh, some light plyometrics, some stuff like that on the field. And then when we start like our sprints, what we'll do is we'll still stay 15 yards apart, but now every kid will have their own yard line in terms of the marked line. So we'll have a kid on the goal line and he has from this sideline to this sideline, that's his. Then the next kid has this straight line. Then the next kid has this straight line. Then the next kid has this straight line. So they're always staying 15 feet apart. We don't sprint that whole distance, but that's their line. That way they're not close to another kid. Uh, and so we'll stack down the field that way and do our sprint work, our uh, longer plyos. Um, right now, uh, so we, right now we have a group here in the weight room, and then we have basically field A. So this half of the field is a, like an exercise group, and then down here, appropriately spaced, would be another exercise group. And the, so we basically got A, B, C, and the kids will cycle through those. When group A finishes in the weight room, I spray everything down. When group B finishes on the field, they spray the sleds, the kettlebells, the dumbbells, whatever we've taken out there, they spray that down. And then group C sprays their stuff down. And then we cycle the kids through, spray it down again, uh, and go from there. So before you start, you know, make sure you get some, some stuff to desanitize uh, from your administration. And ours has been awesome in, in getting us that in our maintenance. Uh, and so that's what we'll do. Then the kids leave. Uh, through here. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. Make sure I'm not forgetting anything here. And like this is kind of harping on the same stuff again. I put uh, the first week, if you program your workouts, like you want the kids to leave feeling like that's it. That's all we did. That will never happen because you're always going to over program it's going to end up being enough or maybe a little too much just off the time they've had off to where if you come in and program, like you have to make up for lost time, they're going to be freaking buried for two, three, four days uh, and you're greatly increasing your risk of energy or injury. So I definitely would uh, hold back on what you would normally do and slowly break the kids in slow. Because like I said, you'll, you'll see it in your warm-ups uh, very soon that uh, they're not where they need to be at. And so here is our Mondays. This is what we've done on Monday the first three weeks uh, in terms of on the field, weight room work, that type of stuff. So I'm just going to go over uh, each of those and you kind of see how it progresses. Let's share my screen. All right, so here, we actually go to my team builder. On team builder, it looks a lot more smooth. Uh, but we'll go over it from here. Uh, they'll do their warm up. You know, these are all t done in increments of 10 yards. And on the first day, we literally had a kid puke right here. We had several kids puke each day right there. And so we did 10 yards of knee pulls twice. We did 10 yards of quad walk twice. We did 10 yards of overhead lunge twice. And then we got kids routing. And so, you know, right there, they're not where they need to be at. And so this is week one. Uh, like I said, all these were 10 yards. And then week one, we tried to keep things short, everything 10 yards. So we did straight leg run, two sets of 10 yards. And this is all we did that week. Uh, pogo hops, two sets of 10 yards. Single leg A skips, two sets of 10 yards. A skip, two sets of 10 yards. Uh, stick jumps, four sets of three jumps. Uh, tempo push-ups, four sets of five. Now. That one's a lot harder than it sounds because you're going, you're controlling the tempo as the coach. So yeah, it's only 20 push-ups, but we're going down on a four count. We're holding for a two count and we're going up on a one count. Uh, so it takes a lot longer than 20 push-ups normally would take. Um, and if you do that stuff, guys, uh, encourage your kids to be honest with themselves. So 
several of our start no linemen, they cannot make it through it doing perfect push-ups. So I'd rather the kid go to their knees and get a full range of motion than cheating me and just doing a, a elbow bend on the third set because they can't make it through anymore. So be honest with them. And I tell our kids all the time, there's freaking division one guys right now that are having to do push-ups from their knees. And so if they can do it, you can do it. And, and you're going to get a lot better for it in the long run. All the body holds, four sets of 20 seconds. Uh, IYT complex, basically five sets of two, six sets of two. And then we did a Tabata line sprint. And this, uh, I did it with the first two groups and cut it with the last two groups because it ended up just being too much in terms of, uh, you know, 20 seconds of, now it's called a sprint, but it turns into not a sprint. And it's essentially just slow mundane cardio. Uh, and I was just kind of doing it to see where we were at. Uh, and like I said, I ended up cutting it after the first two groups. Uh, and that's all we did the first day, uh, week one. Week two, uh, it's pretty much essentially the same thing. Only thing week two, we added a rep to the tempo push-ups. Uh, and like I said, essentially everything else uh, stayed the same. And then week three, we'll go over how we kind of started to phase in the weight room. There we go. Let me share screen. All right. And so week three, we kind of started ramping up, building stuff a little bit. And we went from instead of two sets of 10 yards on a lot of these, we went to two sets of 20 yards. So basically, you know, doubled it up there. We started, we didn't sprint hardly at all the first two weeks. We made it some starts. Now we're working in a couple sprints. Uh, but the same thing with your sprints, I wouldn't just roll straight into a 50 yard sprint or a, a 40 yard sprint. We're gonna start with 20s. And we're, we started with flying 10s. It starts, then flying 10s. Now we're building the flying 20s. You know, as we get further, we'll get into 30s uh, and, and, and build up from there. So start your sprints accordingly too, because if you just, I think of it this way. Yeah, I can say, uh, if you just run straight into a 50 yard sprint, you could have a kid pull a hamstring or you could, you know, have something happen. 99% of the time you may not. So a coach out there may see, well, I, I've done this and nothing's happened. Well, my response would be nothing's happened yet. Uh, you know, uh, I'll be, first thing, I'll never encourage this, but you, you, in college or high school, you hear guys talk about, oh, well, I drive drunk all the time. Well, just because you got away with it one time, there's going to be your time come where you, where you get pulled over and it's essentially the same thing in this. Uh, just because you've gotten away with something, there's going to be a time come where something does go south. Uh, so I always, you know, over, over side on the side of caution. And then you can see here, this is where we kind of started to phase in uh, the different aspects of the weight room. I should have done this on Team Builder. It looks a lot more smooth. But uh, so here, like today, there was one third of the guys we had there, they were doing backward sled walk. One third of the guys there were doing kettlebell field flow. And then one third of the guys there were inside doing barbell complex. And just going over these backward sled walk, you just basically take your battle ropes um, that you would, you know, you do the, the things with, um, and you attach them around the sled and you literally just walk backwards with it. Uh, we went across the field and then back each kid having their own line like we went over earlier. And then kettlebell field flow, one, that one, they're just getting 10 kettlebell swings on the sideline. Again, they all got their own line like we went over earlier. Uh, they single arm farmers walk to the first hash, single arm overhead carry to the next hash, single arm farmers walk to the next hash, 10 kettlebell swings, then they bring it back doing the same thing on their left arm. They'll do that two rounds. And then barbell complex, 10, 10, 10, uh, they're getting 10 RDLs, 10 bent over rows, 10 shrugs, 10 overhead press, and then 10 back squats. And uh, obviously the, the weights they're using for those are very minimal. Uh, a lot of our guys were using the bar. Uh, some of our stronger guys obviously used 10s, 5s. I think a couple got up to 25s. But understand the weight on that's gonna be uh, uh, very minimal. Well, that's just 
three Mondays for us and how we've got back. Now, football-wise, uh, like we talked about, uh, our head coach has actually left, uh, but we're still doing practice uh, on Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, we're doing our individual drills there. Uh, as far as O-line goes, we can't have any pads, any shields, uh, anything like that. And so they're just working a lot of steps, stance. Uh, you know, backs and receivers are, are catching the ball, running routes. Uh, we're fortunate. Some states can't even throw a ball, so that's been good for us. Now, we run it 90% uh, of the time, so it doesn't really apply to what we do, but it's going to make our weak point better, you know, so uh, take advantage of uh, for what it's worth. And that's the presentation. Um, you know, try to go over – pretty much everything we've been through and de dealing with this and uh, just trying to hit the key areas. Uh, got a lot of messages from guys, uh, you know, asking specifically, and I'm trying to get back to all those guys, but, uh, you know, I am trying to run our program and uh, I have, I have a kid and, and all this, so I can't get back to everybody, but I try to put out a couple posts uh, and, and do things like this that kind of help answer some of those questions I get uh, commonly. Uh, that, that was good stuff, Coach, and I think you emphasized it well, the idea that you've got to progress back to where you would normally be this time of year. You know, the idea of lost time, that's exactly what it is, lost time. We're not getting it back. They are where they are, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's gone. You know, there's, there's nothing you can do. Uh, every January, we basically do like a general, prep, general physical preparation phase, and uh, that's essentially what we've started back with here. Uh, and then after our dead period, we'll get back to kind of more what we were planning on doing in the summer. So, Coach, do you have any concern at all um, that your guys may not be ready for the football season? Uh, I'm going to steal a, a quote from Tony Holler on this one. Uh, and the fact that we'd rather have our guys 100% healthy and 80% in shape than 100% uh, in shape and 80% healthy. Uh, especially with regards to week one, you know, obviously we want to go compete. We want to win week one. Uh, but the goal is to win in week eight, nine, ten, 10 uh, in winning the playoffs and peak there rather than peaking in week one. So uh, we're gonna do what we can leading up to week one. And then, like I said, I want to make my run uh, in November and not uh, August. So that's when we'll be ready uh, hitting on all cylinders. Heard that, Coach. That's exactly right. The, the place I was the past four years, that was our big thing. You know, when you think about it, week one, week two, week three, you're still kind of in a conditioning process, right? You're still getting acclimated. It's still, in a lot of places, it's still in the 90s. I know up in Kentucky, southern Indiana, you're still yeah. in 90-degree weather, 95-degree weather in August, early September. So you you, especially now at these times, you're mapping out and you're programming your conditioning. Like you said, I'm going to beat you in week nine, 10, and in the playoffs, you know, but week one, we still have work to do. Yeah. And the thing is you could do all the conditioning you want. You can have the best conditioning program on the planet. Uh, sacrifice your strength, sacrifice your speed. If you want to just get in condition. And when you get to week one, your dudes are still going to get tired in the game. When you get to week two, you're still going to get tired in the game. You have to play yourself in the true condition. Now, you can do some things to cut into that to make them not as tired or to make them not get tired as early. Uh, but to get in true game shape, you got to play games. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're big proponents of the tribe test. Uh, kind of simulates a game for our conditioning. Uh, but even that, it doesn't take into account the nerves the kid has before he runs out of a tunnel or the nerves a kid has when he's a freaking sophomore and he's scratching Pokemon cards during lunch, and he's going off playing against an 18-year-old who just bought lotto tickets and smoked cigarettes before the game. So uh, uh, it doesn't take into effect those things. And uh, like you said, you got to basically play yourself into it. Uh, obviously, emphasize that it's important, but uh, to truly get in condition, you got to play the game. So you you've had a few weeks to to kind of get back to it, whereas some states like Kentucky just got back today. Well, most parts of Kentucky just back today. Southern Indiana, the state of Indiana, we're getting back July 1st or July 6th. Do you leave the workouts thinking, yeah, we got better even with these restrictions? Or do you think, 
man, if, not, if these restrictions weren't here, we would have gotten this, this, or that done. Yeah, uh, so for we're definitely getting better. Uh, for me, it, it, I've always been a huge – the weight room is more important than anything guy. Uh, and this time out of the weight room has shown me you can make tremendous strides. This pains me to say, like I said, I'm a huge – freaking weight room guy, but you can get a lot done not in the weight room. Uh, you can work on your mechanics. You can work on your speed. Uh, you can work, And you can get stronger by sprinting. If you're a 300-pound, I tell our guys this, if you're a 300-pound O-lineman and you're sprinting to your maximum ability, you're going to get stronger. I mean, that's going to make you stronger just by moving your large body at, you know, at, at its maximum capability. So you can build strength as much as it pains me to say, uh, outside of the weight room. And, and that's been a huge area area of emphasis for us. Uh, you know, a little bit of my background, my first strength and conditioning job uh, was at a place called Blyville. Awesome, awesome kids. Uh, we did some awesome things there uh, with regards to the program. But bottom line is the kids there were genetically gifted compared to the kids uh, at a lot of other places. We could just show up on Friday night and be the fastest team in the conference without doing any speed training. And we spent all our times in the weight room. So I thought it was the weight room as a young coach, you know, I thought, oh, what I'm doing in the weight rooms made these guys fast. No, they were fast when they walked in the door of the freaking field house that day. Uh, if anything, hell, I probably made them slower by us not ever getting outside uh, and actually sprinting. Uh, so they, they overcame my bad training and still uh, were – elite fast dudes so learned a lot from there and then like I said take this for what it's worth uh practice wise you know we can throw the ball we can't hand it off that makes no sense to me but that's the rule uh and we run it 90 percent of the time but now we can work on our 10 percent area of weakness uh, uh going forward so take advantage of what you can do during this time and and it beats being able to do nothing so uh exactly right well, Coach, I appreciate the time. Um, fantastic presentation. I've been looking forward to, to talking to you for a few weeks now. I've followed you on Twitter. Um, again, your Twitter handle, uh, remind everybody real quick. I, I don't have it off the top of my head. It's uh, Coach D. Smith, C-O-A-C-H-D-E-E -E Smith. And then, guys, any, any guys that have, like, shot me a message, I'm trying my, my best to get back to everybody. I uh, don't want you to think I'm like a, some dude that's trying to big time here or whatever the hell. I'm just a high school strength coach. Uh, but I, I'll try to get back to everybody, you know, as fast as I can. Uh, if I don't get back to you guys, the best way to actually get a hold of me, I'll probably regret doing this. I may get 975 texts. Uh, but if you'll ever just shoot me a text, if, if you got my number, just shoot me a text. And uh, I, I'll, that's a heck of a lot easier for me to respond to than uh, going through Twitter and, and all that. Email Coach D Smith one at gmail.com. That's Coach D E E Smith one at gmail.com. And then I'll get back to you on there. And uh, I want to help anybody I can. You know, a lot of times, uh, strength coaches, we get a bad vibe or bad rap. And I'm guilty of this too. You know, pointing out everything that everybody's doing wrong uh, when number one, we've done crap wrong too. And number two, we don't provide. Uh, a better way to do it or show a better way to do it. We just talk bad about somebody. So, uh, like I said, I'm guilty of that too. So, I'm going to do better in that regard, and I'll try to help anybody I can. Coach, we appreciate it. And for our Chief Pigskin viewers, uh, for anybody watching this video on YouTube, there's a lot more content. Uh, check us out at the Chief Pigskin uh, online clinic at clinic.chiefpigskin.com. Be sure to click like and subscribe on our YouTube channel for more uh, content just like this. Coach Smith, we appreciate it. Have a good one, man. Appreciate it, man. Have a good one.